Tell somebody, we are the gifted. We are the gifted, and the gifts that God gives us are our tools for building the kingdom. So I just want to jump into this text. In, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, the apostle Paul is writing to his young mentor, his young student in the ministry, his young disciple, Timothy. And he starts off the book of Timothy by saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. He says to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus. Jesus our Lord. Then he says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. So Paul wants Timothy to know that I never stop praying for you, that I always have your back in prayers. He says, I remember recalling your tears. I long to see you so that you may be filled with joy because they hadn't seen each other in a while. And when they had departed the last time, Timothy knew it was going to be a while before he saw his father in ministry. So it was a lot of tears, a lot of emotions. But he said, I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandma Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives also in you. Beloved of all the things that you and I can hand down to our children, the greatest thing that we can hand down to our children is the gift of faith. Because how many of you know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen? You may not have a $2 million insurance policy. You may not have a house in the Hamptons to give your children. But if you can pass on the gift of faith, if you can live a life of faith in such a way that your children begin to imitate it. Is there anybody here who knows that the reason you and I are here right now is because we had an opportunity to imitate a great grandfather's faith, to imitate our uncle's faith, to imitate the faith of those deacons that used to pray on the front row, and somehow imitating their faith turned into a sincere and genuine faith in each and every one of us. If you know what I'm talking about, shout hallelujah. So then as we come into 2 Timothy 1 and 6, Paul says something that is interesting. He says, for this reason, I ask you to keep using the gift God gave you. I, it came to you when I laid my hands on you and prayed that God would use you. So this verse is loaded. Paul says, I want you to keep using the gift. Elbow your neighbor, tell him you have a gift. He said, and this gift came to you through the Holy Spirit when I laid my hands on you and prayed that God would use you. And I need somebody to know that somewhere along the line, somebody in each and every one of our lives prayed that we would be used mightily by the Most High God. Is there anybody here who knows what I'm talking about? And I've just come to tell somebody, you got to keep on using the gift. Somebody say, keep on using the gift. Yeah, I, I remember, I can remember, um, I know y'all more saved than I am, um, but I can remember, I can remember in club days when a person would drop it like it's hot, they would say, shake what your mama gave you. I, I know y'all don't know nothing about that because I know y'all been saved since birth. Well, I want you to, I want to change that up. I wanted to tell you, use the gift that your daddy gave you. Tell somebody, use the gift your daddy gave you. You, you see, the enemy wants you and me to stop using the gift that God gave you. The preach, and I, let me tell you a story. That in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and back in the days when Baptist people didn't speak in tongues, back in the days when Baptist people didn't lay hands and, and on the sick, back in the days when Baptist people didn't have praise and worship teams, there was this Baptist preacher. There was this Baptist preacher. I'm talking about back in the days when the ushers would, would stand like this. You know, and, and, and you know, they, you know but, but there was this preacher in, in Baltimore, Maryland. And, I mean, he was a Baptist preacher. And he wasn't the best preacher in the world in terms of oratory. But this man had a gift of healing. This man had a gift of deliverance. If he laid his hand on you, whatever the condition, that condition was going to be gone. If he spoke a word over you concerning any circumstance or situation, that circumstance or situation was going to right-size itself and get right in your presence. But the brethren, tell somebody the brethren, 
They told him, Doc, you need to work more on your hoop. Doc, you need to work more on your clothes. And he abandoned the gift that God gave him, and he just shriveled up and pretty much died on the vine. Beloved, I've come to tell you that God has placed a gift in you and me. And don't let anybody tell you not to use your gift and not to develop your gift because God knew who he was giving the gift to when he assigned that gift to your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, now can, I, can I tell a story about Dr. Danita L. Wolford Blow? Dr. Danita L. Wolford Blow gives some good gifts to her friends and family members. I mean, she gives some great gifts. She gives some gifts that when she's shopping for them on Amazon, I'm like, you sure you won't give that? But let me tell you something. If we go over to that friend, family, or relative's house, and that gift is sitting in the, in the, is not being used, is sitting in the garage, guess what? She gonna leave that friend, family, or relative's house with that gift. We have so many. I didn't know you could repossess gifts. We have so many repossessed gifts in our kitchen, in our family room, on our shelf. You got this little digital frame that she repossessed from somebody. You know, all the different pictures come across. And, and, but they've got repossessed. Because she went over there and discovered that they weren't using their gift. So she took back the gift. And I need somebody to know that sometimes the most high God is like Dr. Danita. And that if you do not use your gift, you will lose your gift. Look at your neighbor and say, don't lose your gift. Beloved, you and I cannot be passive about our spiritual gifts. We've got to keep them fresh and vibrant. Don't you remember the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30? One man got five talents. One man got two talents. The man who had five made five more. The man who had two made two more. And the man who had one buried his talent. And because he buried his talent, when the master came back, he said, well, take the one talent that he has and give it to the one with five talents, so that with only with ten talents, so that he'll now have eleven. He said, because to whom much is given, much is required. And for everyone who has much, much more will be given. But who, everyone who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Look at your neighbor and say, don't lose your gift. It says it like this in 2 Timothy 1 and 6 in the King James Version. It says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. Last week, we learned that the Holy Spirit was poured out on all believers to usher in the last days. Now, I was going to go to the store this morning, but we didn't get in until 3 o'clock in the morning. I was going to go to the store and get a pitcher and some Kool-Aid. But now you guys have to just see this picture in your mind. If you can imagine the pitcher being you, and if you can imagine the Kool-Aid being the Holy Spirit being poured out. When you pour the Kool-Aid, let's say you're using the, the, the urban flavor of red Kool-Aid. If you're pouring the red, it's not, it's not cherry, it's red. And you're pouring the red Kool-Aid into the pitcher. What you will notice is that the red Kool-Aid particles just flake and go to the bottom of the pitcher. And the pitcher does not change colors. The pitcher does not change colors until you take the stirrer and begin to stir up the colors. And then the pitcher water will turn from, from clear to red when you stir it up. What are you saying, David Blow? I need somebody to know that on the day you got saved, the Holy Spirit poured himself out on you and me. But some of us are allowing him to lay in the bottom of our lives and are not allowing him to be used. And I need you to understand that every trauma, every circumstance, every situation, good, bad, or indifferent, God is sending it into our lives so that we will use the stirrer and stir up the gifts and make up in our minds that we have that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I need you to look at a neighbor and say, stir up the gifts. Stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. Yeah. Tell somebody, you're letting all that good gift lay in the bottom of your life. The spoon is the things in life that God uses to stir us to take a stand. Tell somebody, I've allowed the Holy Spirit to lay dormant in my life for too long. But is there anybody here who's made up in your mind that I'm stirring it up? I went to Webster. Webster says to stir means that to stir means that it means to be added through mixing. So what the Holy Spirit is saying is the more you stir, the more you mix the contents of the Holy Spirit into your life. 
until after a while, just like with a pitcher of Kool-Aid or whatever your favorite crystal beverage is, it's indiscernible about what is the crystals and what is the water. The Holy Spirit wants to be such a part of you and me that it's indiscernible who is who and what is what. Elbow somebody say, stir up the gifts. Oh, I love the way they say it in the inter New International Version. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Fan into flame means to keep feeding the fire so that it does not go dim. So whether you stir it, whether you fan it, you got to be sure to use it. Tell somebody, use your gift. There may be somebody here who is saying, I do not have a gift. Well, guess what? The Apostle Peter has an answer for you in 1 Peter 4 and 10. He says, God has given each of you a gift. Tell somebody, you've got a gift. Use it to help each other. This will show God's loving favor. In the NIV, he says it like this. Each of you should use whatever you gift you've had, whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. In the NLT, he says, God has given you each a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Tell somebody, you've got a gift. Can, can, we, can we just call out some gifts? Romans 12 and 8 says it like this. If your gift is to encourage, be encouraging. Are there any encouragers in the house? If your gift is to encourage, then use your gift to encourage. Don't, don't get upset. People say, oh, here comes Sarah Sunshine. Here comes Harry Happy. That's right, I'm Harry Happy. That's right, I'm Sally Sunshine. Because my gift is to bring encouragement to this house. You got to let people know, this would be a boring place if an encourager weren't in the house. Look at your neighbor. I need everybody with the gift of encouragement to say, God, thank you for the gift of encouragement. And here's the thing, for people with the gift of encouragement, he puts you around sour people. Because you're the one with the gift. So don't get upset. I'm here with this job with all these sour people. I'm on my assignment to bring sunshine in this place. God, thank you for giving me a venue where I can use my gift. Woo. See, some of us are complaining about the place where God is blessing us. If your gift is giving, give generously. Child, how much you going to give to that church? Child, how much you going to give to that preacher on TV? Child, how, how many mobile food drives you going to do? That's my gift. I'm a giver. Any givers in the house, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Say, I'm a giver. I give generously. You going to wake up in the middle of the night and give somebody a ride to the airport? Yes, I am. Because that's my gift. That's my sweet spot. If God has given you leadership ability, okay, hmm, is there anybody here, wherever there's the breakout group at work, wherever there's the breakout group at school, people, do, even people who outrank you default to your leadership? Anybody ever had that happen? Stop saying, no, I don't want to lead. Lead! If others recognize that gift, then operate in that gift. Tell somebody I have the gift. I, I, I don't want to offend nobody. Offend them. Operate in your gift. Tell somebody my gift is leadership. If your gift is leadership, why intentionally follow foolishness? Hello? <laughs> Take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. If you're around a bunch of sourpuss people and you have the gift of just showing a more excellent way, do it gladly. If someone has the gift of speaking words of comfort, you know, people going through, dealing with this, that, or the other, and you have the ability, then speak it. If someone has the gift of sharing what he has, he should give with a willing heart. If someone has the gift of leading other people, he should lead them. If someone has the gift of shine, showing kindness to others, he should be happy as he does it. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. Y'all missed that. Some, somebody say it with me. To those 
who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, look at your neighbor and say, you got to watch out for the do-nothings. For those that do nothing, even what they have will be taken away from us. Some of us don't have because we do nothing. Ooh, y'all don't like me no more. Pastor Lowe, you need to go on back to Puerto Rico. Y'all don't like me no more. Some of us don't have anything because we don't do anything with the gifts that we have. Even when God puts us in places to exercise our gifts, we won't exercise them. But look at what Paul said. Look at what Paul says to Timothy. For this reason, I ask you to keep using the gift that God gave you. It came to you when I laid my hands on you and prayed that God would use you. And most of us know verse 7. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Look at your neighbor and say, understand what Paul was saying. Because what the enemy will do is once you get comfortable in operating in your gifts, he'll make you afraid to use your gift. Because he understands that your gift can do damage to his kingdom. But I need somebody in here to lift your hands and declare, I will no longer be afraid to use my gift because God has not given me a spirit of fear. Now understand what that means is that if there's fear in your life, you can understand that it did not come from God. If there's fear in your life, it did not come from the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. But if there's fear in your life, it came from the pit of hell. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Tell somebody, no, my gift is real the fear is phony so in in first Corinthians chapter 12 Paul says now about the gifts of the spirit brothers and sisters I do not want you to be uninformed you know that before you were Christians you were led to worship false gods none of these gods could speak all of us have worshiped false gods They, they 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 may not they may not have names like Baal or Beelzebub but they had names like Fendi and coach and Lexus hello in here because we would do anything to have those names on us hello it says it says so I tell you look at this that no one speaking by the Holy Spirit can say that he hates Jesus no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the help of the Holy Spirit I need somebody to holler out you can't say it Unless he allows it. Let's do it to the test. On the count of three, I want everybody who can to say Jesus is Lord. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Look at your name and say, that means you have the Holy Spirit. Because you can't say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. I know those old mothers used to tell you that you can't have the Holy Spirit until you've spoken in other tongues. But the Bible tells me that I can't say Jesus is Lord except with the help of the Holy Spirit. Tell somebody, I got it, I got it, I got it. I have the Holy Spirit because I can say Jesus is Lord. In fact, the Spirit had me before I had him. Somebody shout hallelujah. But here's the rub, Dr. Danita. Jesus is Lord goes beyond reciting the sentence. It speaks of a lifestyle and a relationship with the Lord Jesus. Jesus as Lord is a declaration of who he is in creation. But it's also a declaration of the seat that he occupies in my life. Is there anybody here who has made Jesus Lord of your life? It's not just lip service, but he is Lord of your life. Without the advocate personality of the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to make this statement, but it's even more impossible to back it up. I'm not like a gangster rap star who will sing all these songs with misogynistic lyrics and say all these B words and H words and N words and then get up and get the Grammy and say, I like to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. No! There is a disconnect because those lyrics don't honor your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to give praise to the Antichrist, but that's not Jesus Christ. Because when we say Jesus is Lord, our lifestyle backs it up. Tell your neighbor, my lifestyle backs it up. 
And if you're like me, even on the occasions when your lifestyle doesn't back it up, the Holy Spirit convicts you so bad that you got to line it up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The Holy Spirit convicts you so bad that you just got to go in your closet and you got you to gotta say this public cell sack, sackcloth and ashes because that's how bad I need to repent. Somebody say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody say, he's Lord over my life. The fact that you and I can declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and the fact that you and I go to great lengths to live a lifestyle that backs up that declaration of faith is proof positive that the Holy Spirit is active in our lives. Somebody lift your hands and say he's active in our lives. <laughs> and you see, y'all heard me use this term before. God doesn't just want you and I to be cosmetic Christians. If you've ever watched any of those HGTV shows on streaming, it's the same plot every time. They go in and they're going to fix up a house. And, and they say, oh, it's going to be this much. This is the rental budget. And they start tearing out walls. And then they go to break and they come back and they found something. <laughs> same show, same show every episode. They found something. And what happens is they say we can't put up the drywall. We can't put in the backsplash until we deal with what we found. Hello in here. That's where the Holy Spirit does in our lives. The Holy Spirit does not just want us to be Christians who look good, but he wants us to be Christians who have God all on the inside of us in such a way that we can accomplish good for him. So that's why in some of our lives, he's working in one area. In another of our lives, he's working in another area. But I come to assure everybody in this house, you can guarantee that if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he is at work in your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's why the Bible says in Philippians 2 and 11, and every tongue will say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone will give honor to God the Father. The Bible says in John 15 and 6, if anyone does not give his life for me, he is cut off like a branch and dries up. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and they will burn. Or burn. What Jesus Christ means is that he is not only our source, but he is our resource. John 15 and 16 says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I've set you up part for the work of bringing in fruit. Your fruit should last, and whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. I need somebody to lift your hands and declare, God chose me. I didn't choose him, but he chose me. Tell somebody he chose me. And, and beloved, when you understand that you've been chosen by the Most High God, that makes you act a little bit differently. That makes you talk a little bit differently. You don't have to settle for leftovers when God has the best for you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Ooh, thank you, Father. 1 John 4 and 3. 1 John 4 and 3. It says this. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Tell somebody, simple test. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and is now already in the world. You beloved, we have to thank the Lord that you and I can make the profession that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because any spirit that is unable to make this profession is not of God. That's what it means to say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul says it like this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 21. He says, Christ is as God is. God cannot be seen. Christ lived before anything was. Christ made everything in the heavens and on the earth. He made everything that is seen and things that are not seen. He made all the powers of heaven. Everything was made by him and for him. Christ was before all things. All things are held together by him. Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning of all things. He is the first to be raised from the dead. He he had first place in everything. God the Father was pleased to have everything made perfect by Christ his Son. Everything in heaven and on earth can come to God because of Christ's death on the cross. Christ's blood has made peace. At one time, you and I were strangers to God, and our minds were at war with him, and our thoughts and actions were wrong. But tell somebody, but not anymore. Because now Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Is there anybody here who can say, Jesus Christ is Lord? And it is the Holy Spirit, beloved, that empowers you and me to say that. So Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 12 and 4. He says there are different kinds of gifts. Tell somebody different kinds of gifts. But the same Holy Spirit. Tell somebody same Holy Spirit. 
tell somebody, there's not, there's not more than one Holy Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter whether you go to the river, whether you go to a tabernacle up the street. If it's the same Holy Spirit, tell somebody it's the same Holy Spirit. So look at this. Somebody say same, same spirit, different gifts, same giver. Somebody say it again. Different gifts, same giver. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11, the Holy Spirit works in each person in one way or another for the good of all. Somebody say God is at work. And the work that God is doing in you and me, beloved, is for the good of everybody. And here's that list again in 1 Corinthians. He says one person is the given the gift of teaching words of wisdom. That's preaching. Another person is given the gift of teaching what he has learned and knows. These gifts are by the same spirit. Somebody say same spirit. Same spirit. One person receives the gift of faith. You, you, do you know those people that just believe God for everything? I mean, they just believe God for everything. And, and it happens. Tell somebody that's a gift. Another person receives the gift of healing. People that can declare themselves healed, can declare you healed, and it happens. But look, these gifts are given by the same Spirit. Another person is given the gift of speaking in special sounds. That's tongues. Another person is given the gift of telling what those special sounds mean. That's the gift of interpretation. But tell somebody, it's the same Spirit. Another person is given the gift of telling what those sounds mean, but it's the same Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, who does all these things. He gives to each person what he wants to give. Tell somebody, thank God for my gift. I need somebody to understand that you have a gift. Tell somebody, you have a gift. Now, here's the thing. Ooh, 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 ooh. You and I have gifts. Tell somebody, we have gifts. Now, the gifts of the Spirit are just, anybody been to one of them super fancy dinner parties where you got your plate here, and you got your forks here, and you got your spoons here, and you got another fork here, you got your salad fork, you got your, and you got all these different glasses and so forth, and each spoon has a purpose. And for those of you that went to a little etiquette training, you know, before the prom or the cotillion, you know, you eat from the outside in. You know, so if you ever one of those, you eat from the outside in and dessert is from the back forward. Hello in here. That'll help you the next time. Somebody's going to be at a dinner party. They're going to hear outside and okay, so this must be for the salad. Okay, dessert from the back forward. Okay, so this is for my, this is for my palate cleanser. This is for my ice cream and this is for my pie. Okay, thank you, Pastor Blow. Okay, I got that. <laughs> so when you go to a fancy dinner party, all the utensils are on the table. Are y'all follow what I'm saying? Every utensil you will need in order to get through that meal is already on the table. Every tool you need to get through that dinner is already on the table. Are y'all with me? I need you to understand that even though God gives gifts to individuals as, they, as, as he has decided, that does not mean that all the other gifts are not available to you. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? What, what God does is God says, think about that dinner party. Now, if I'm witnessing on the corner, I don't necessarily need the gift of tongues in that moment. Right. Not the gift of glossolalia or heavenly tongues. If I am I, at a bowling alley and I just need to share with people the gift the, about Jesus Christ, I don't necessarily need the gift of the interpretation of tongues. But I might need the gift of encouragement. I might need the gift of discernment when I'm in certain circumstances and situations. So what God says is that whatever gift you need is available to you when you need it. So just because you may not have stirred up that particular gift does not mean that that gift is not available to you. Whatever gifts the Holy Spirit has made available is available to every believer in abundance. All you have to do is ask God for it. Oh, thank those seven people. I, I, yes, Pastor Blow, yes. Because we have been taught to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. But I've come to tell you that just like orange juice is not for just for breakfast anymore, the Holy Spirit is not just for Pentecostals and apostolics anymore. 
for the work that God is calling the body of Christ to do. He needs every single solitary believer in this room to eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Tell somebody you have the Holy Spirit and you have access to the gifts. Somebody shout hallelujah. Look at your name and say, I got to use my gifts. And look at this, Pastor Josh. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 16. Not only does the Holy Spirit give us gifts, but Jesus gave gifts. It says these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Now understand, good leadership in a church is a gift. Take two. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Now, understand that good gift, good leadership is a gift to the church. Listen, just because I'm a part of the leadership of the river is not why I'm saying this. But I thank God every day that the river is not a raggedy, disorganized church. We are a church that operates in excellence. Some folk get upset because we operate in excellence. Some folk get upset because we have a standard. But I thank God that we are not a raggedy ministry. I thank God that whether it's Pastor Jay, whether it's Pastor D, whether it's Pastor Cohen, whether it's Dr. Danita, whether it's Pastor Joshua, whether it's me or any of the other pastors at this church, when we stand to proclaim the gospel, it is a well-studied, well-prepared, well-prayed, well-informed gospel message that does a work in your life. Because God's got a word and you can always find it at the river. It doesn't matter whether it's a pastor that hoops or whether it's a pastor that sits down. It's still a powerful word. Somebody needs to understand. Somebody, got, somebody needs to lift your hand and say, God, thank you for my gift. Thank you for my gift. Thank you for my gift. You see, God loved you enough to put you in a place where you are well managed, well taken care of. You've never had a pastor of this church ask you for your phone number. Ask you to be their side piece. Tell somebody, not going to happen here. Somebody lift your hands and say, thank God for my gifts. Somebody say, thank God for my gift. Somebody say, he's just bragging on the church. Yes, because it's a blessing to have a good church. The apostle John was told by the angel that if you don't value your lampstand, God will move your lampstand. Somebody lift your hand and say, Father, don't move my lampstand. That's why I pray for Pastor Marvin. That's why I pray for Pastor D. That's why I pray for all the pastors and leaders at this church because I don't want God to move my lampstand. Anybody ever been in a raggedy church? If you've been a part of a raggedy church or under the covering of a raggedy church, you need to thank God that he got you out of it and got you into a place of good covering. Somebody say, thank God for the gift. Their responsibility is to equip each God's people for works of ministry until the body of Christ is built up. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we'll be mature in the Lord, measuring up to full and complete standards of Christ. I thank God for gifts of leadership because gifts of leadership challenge us and push us. Is there anybody here who knows this word is pushing you? This word is pushing you. Tell somebody, the word of God pushes me. When I want to go back, the word of God pushes me. When I want to be comfortable. The word of God pushes me. Look at your neighbor and say, the word of God is pushing me. The word of God is pushing me. The word of God is pushing me to a place. I don't know who's there with me, but the word of God is pushing me to a place where I believe I'm going to be standing in line at Target not too many days from now and start a revival right in the checkout line. Let me push this thing forward. The Apostle Paul's point here can be interpreted that the Holy Spirit has given gifts to the believer and Jesus Christ has given gifts to the church. 
more importantly, Paul is letting us know that godly leadership is a gift. You and I may not always agree 100% with godly leadership, but it is still godly and it's still a gift. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I got four minutes and 55 seconds left. Can I tell you a story? There was this dude, there was this dude, and he was, he was trolling me on Facebook. Yeah, he was trolling. I know, don't get ghetto church. Somebody's like, where? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody's like, where? <laughs> and that's why I love the river. <laughs> the praise and worship team was about to go out of here. <laughs> He's trolling me on Facebook. He's trolling me on Facebook. I mean, just trolling me bad. Um, you know, Dr. Danita was on Facebook at one time. He said, what kind of woman of God wears a skirt that short? I said, my goodness. You know, and just, just saying all kinds of just abominations and, and mean things about me and so forth. And I didn't know who this dude was. I did not know who this dude was. Did not know who this dude was. But a few risings and settings of the sun, I was in a fellowship with another group of gentlemen. And he said to me, one of the guys in the fellowship said, can you help me with one of my friends? And I said, sure, whatever you need. And when I got there and he began talking, I realized that this was the dude that had been trolling me on Facebook. And my friend said, this is who I need you to pray for. And I did the math and said, you the dude that's been trolling me on Facebook. You the dude that's talking about my wife's skirts. You the dude that's, you the, you the dude. But the Spirit helps you in your weakness. Sometimes you don't know what to say, but the Spirit intercedes with groans and utterances that you cannot understand. Because, fellas, how many of you know that it's okay to talk about me? You can talk about me all day long, but don't talk about my woman. Where are my fellas at? Pastor Josh, all of West Baltimore just welled up in me. But before I knew it, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray your healing upon this brother. I pray your deliverance upon this brother. Because God is a revealer of mysteries. And he will make your enemies have to be blessed by you. The flesh wanted me to, wanted to say, you troll. But the Spirit prayed out of an authentic place. And I believe that he got his healing in the mighty name of Jesus. Tell your neighbor, God will give you inside information. You don't have to let people know that you know that you know. But when you show forth a greater glory... They got to know that God is real. Of all the people that had to pray for that joker, God sent me to pray for. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Tell somebody that's the kind of God we serve. Woo. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 through 28. Tell somebody, all of us together are Christ's body. And each of you is a part of it. In the church, he's given apostles, he's given prophets, he's given teachers, those that work miracles, those that have gifts of healing, those who can help others, those who have gifts of leadership, and those who speak in unknown tongues. And then he asked the question, are all prophets? Nope. Are all teachers? Nope. Or do all do miracles? Nope. Do all have gifts of healing? Nope. Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Nope. Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. But tell somebody, we have the potential to. But here's the thing. Of all the gifts of the Spirit, laying hands on the sick, preaching, teaching, prophesying, leadership, discernment, speaking in unknown tongues. The Bible says that you got to go after the best gift. Tell somebody, go after the best gift. Look at your neighbor and say, go after the best gift. Tell somebody, there's a best gift? Yes, there's a best gift. The Bible says, but from your heart, you should want the best gift. Somebody lift your hands and say, Father, I want the best gift. 
So Paul says, now I will show you an even better way. He says, I may be able to speak the man, the language of men and even of angels. He says, in other words, I may be able to speak glossolalia and xenolalia. I may be able to speak in unknown tongues and unknown earthly tongues. He said, but check this out. He says, but if I do not have love, it's junk. If I do not have love, it's worthless. Hello in here, somebody. I was at a resort this week where there were people from all over the world speaking all kinds of different languages. And they were telling each other jokes and laughing and so forth. And I didn't know what they were saying because I didn't speak any of those languages. So guess what? <laughs> to me, it's just all noise. If they glanced at me and looked like, <laughs> and hope they weren't talking about me. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you and I say that I'm born again, baptized, blood washed, speaking in tongues believer, and we have no love, it means nothing to nobody. I know that's not good English, but it gets your point across. If you say that you're born again, baptized, and you have not love, then your singing is noise. Your preaching is noise. Your witnessing is noise. It's all noise because there's no love to back it up. How can you say you love God who you haven't seen and not love your brother that you see every day? Tell somebody, go after the best gift. Tell somebody, go after the best gift. And the best gift is love. And if you cannot love, go back in your closet and say, Father, before you pull out healing, before you pull out tongues, before you pull out discernment, give me the ability to love. It's tough through here, but somebody's going to get it. Somebody lift your hand and say, I got to learn how to love. I got to learn how to love. Love conquers a multitude of sin. Woo. Tell somebody it's the best gift. He says, if I have the gift of speaking God's word, if I understand all secrets but do not have love, I'm nothing. If you got all the gifts and don't have love, then your gifts are counterfeit. Yeah, yeah. If you have all the gifts and you can't love, then your gifts are counterfeit. That's why I pay close attention to the landscape in our land right now. Because everybody that's proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord and turning around and declaiming all this hate and nastiness to other people, you are serving a counterfeit Christ. Because my Christ is about love. Y'all don't like me no more. Keep on preaching, David Love. If I have the gift of faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. It counts for nothing. If I give everything, if I serve in every mobile food drive in the hot, cold, and the rain. If I give my body to be burned, but do not have love, depart from me, because I never knew you. What's love? Love does not give up. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. That means if somebody's exercising their gift, just because it's not my turn, I don't roll my eyes while they're exercising their gift. Love does not put itself up as being important. Love has, uh-oh, 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 love has no pride. Let that float out there for a minute. Love does not do the wrong thing. Love never thinks of itself. Love does not get angry. Love does not, rem uh-oh. Love does not remember the suffering that somebody else caused you. You know how they do, Lady King, I'm going to get her. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get her. I'm, you know, I'm just waiting on my opportunity. Tell somebody, that's not love. That's not, tell somebody, oh, y'all, it's getting so quiet in here. Hurry on to the end of this message, David. Love. love is not happy with sin. God knows my heart. Love is happy with the truth. Love takes everything that comes its way without giving up. 
Tell somebody, I can't give up. But I love this. Love believes all things. Love hopes for all things. Love keeps on in all things. I need you to tell your neighbor, neighbor, I love you. And I'm believing all things for you. I'm hoping all things for you. And I'm pushing you into all things. And tell somebody, why is the love the greatest gift? Because love never ends. Tell somebody, love never ends. The King James says, love never fails. Tell somebody, love never ends. Love, now look at this. All the gifts will end. Woo. Oh, tell somebody, all the gifts are going to come to an end. The gift of speaking God's word will come to an end. The gift of speaking in tongues will be stopped. The gift of understanding will come to an end. All the gifts will come to an end. It says it like this in the NLT. Prophecy and speaking in other languages will become useless, but love will last forever. Somebody say the best gift. Somebody say the best gift. 1 Corinthians 13 and 3. It says, and now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Tell somebody that's the greatest gift. Tell somebody that's the greatest gift. Are there any lovers in the house this morning? Is there anybody here who can show forth the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord? The Bible says in John 13, 34, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all people will know you are my disciples, by your love for one another. If you cannot love another Christian brother, you are are not a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all don't like this, but I'm a, I, I just got to preach what God gave me. If you're running down the name of a fellow saint and not praying for them, if you're talking about how they dress, if you're talking about how they sound, if you're talking about where they live, that's not love and that's not of God. And if any of us are guilty, lift your hands and say, Father, I'm sorry. Because that does not demonstrate love to the world. Somebody, there used to be a song by foreign and say, I want to know what love is. Tell somebody, I want to know what love is. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples by your love. Paul said it like this in Romans. He said, who can keep us from the love of Christ? Can trouble or problems, can suffering wrong from others or having no food, can it be because of no clothes or because of danger or war? The holy writings say, because of belonging to Jesus, we are in danger of being killed all day long. We are thought of as sheep are ready to be killed, but we have power over all these things through Jesus who loves us so much. Now, here's the thing. If Jesus loves us so much, why are you and I damning up the love of Jesus and not releasing it through us? Woo. Tell somebody, you got to break the dam. He says, for I know that nothing can keep us from the love of God. Death cannot do it. Life cannot do it. Angels cannot do it. Leaders cannot do it. Any other power cannot. Hard things now or in the future cannot. The world above or the world below cannot. Any other thing that cannot keep us away from the love of God, which is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody needs to understand that God is calling you and me to love. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, Continue to show deep love for one another, for love covers over a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well. Tell somebody, use them well. I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to go. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to go. Y'all ready to go? Yes, y'all ready to go, because y'all done got quiet on me. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would not whosoever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life throw up first corinthians 14 and 1 look what it says i need y'all to read the i need y'all to read the 1 2 3 4 5 6 the first six words of this passage 1 2 3 4 
five, six. Are y'all ready? Everything before the exclamation point. I need y'all to read it at the count of three. One, two, three. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. Another translation says, let love be your greatest gift. Is there anybody here who can lift your hand and who can declare, say, Father, I want love to be my highest goal. I don't want to just aspire to be a great this. I don't want to just aspire to be a great that or the other. I don't want to just speak in tongues. I don't want to just lay hands on the sick. But, Father, I want to be somebody who loves other people like you love me. If there's anybody here who wants love, love to be your highest goal. If there's anybody here who wants love to be your greatest gift, then stand on your feet and give God about 35 seconds of praise. Stand on your feet and give God about 35 seconds of glory. Let the Lord know that I want love to be my greatest goal. I want somebody to experience the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus through me. Is there anybody here who wants somebody to experience the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus through you? They give God the praise. They give God the glory. They give God the honor and declare, say, Father, say, Father, from now on, love is my highest goal. Say, Father, from now on, love is my highest goal. Somebody declare, say, Father, from now on, I'm going to love the hell out of every person in my life. I'm going to love the hell out of my co-workers. I'm going to love the hell out of my dependents. Is there anybody here who knows that love will get the hell out your house? That love will get the hell out your finances? That love will get the hell out your relationships? Somebody lift your hands and say, I'm loving, I'm loving, I'm loving the hell out because Jesus loved hell out of me. Is there anybody here who used to be a hellion? Is there anybody here who was filled up with all kinds of demons and imps? But Jesus stepped in. The Holy Spirit evicted every demon, every imp, and all the hell that used to be in you. He cast out, and now your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I need somebody to declare, do you know what did it? Do you know what did it? Do you know what did it? Love did it. Love did it. Love did it. Deacon Dennis, back in the day, they said, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Is there anybody here who's been lifted by the love of God? Anybody else who's been lifted by the love of God? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the same love that lifted me is the same love that I must use to lift somebody else. This week, I'm going to use my love to lift somebody out of a circumstance. I'm going to use my love to lift somebody out of a situation. This week, I'm going to see what love can do. Somebody, anybody, everybody, scream. Can you scream?